Our text is the reading from chapter 12 of Deuteronomy. Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them. Inquire not after their God, saying, How did these nations serve their God? <laughs> With these verses, the book of Deuteronomy takes a new turn. Up to this point, Moses has pointed the people to their past history and to the grand theme of the Ten Commandments. But from this point forward, he will describe the details of daily life, your personal relationships in family and with your neighbors, business and social contracts, civil and criminal cases. You will find that the material is not neatly organized, perhaps because our own lives are not neatly organized. Moses begins by saying, These are the statutes and laws which ye shall observe to do in the land which the God of your father giveth you. If you are going to keep a right relationship with God, only then can you deal with people who are made in the image of God. If you lose your center of gravity with the eternal, you will forever be off balance with things temporal. Moses goes on to say, you shall utterly destroy the places where those nations worship, on the mountains and the hills and under every green tree. Overthrow their altars, break down their pillars, burn their groves in the fire, and destroy their graven images. Anywhere and everywhere they come upon the pagan shrines, they are to destroy them. Moses does not say why the heathen worshipped upon the high hills and the mountains, or why they thought the shady glen of a grove of trees was a sanctuary. Moses does not enter into the thinking and theology of paganism. Moses gives you no explanation for the symbolism of their pillars and wooden poles and altars, images and shrines. Only this, you are utterly to destroy them completely wherever you find them. Evidently, Moses is suspicious of this religious open-mindedness, this ecumenical broad-mindedness today. He knows the subtle temptation. When you start fooling around with a false religion, You've taken the first step down a road that runs away from your God. Moses has no time for intellectual curiosity, historical inquiry, or scholarly research of that which is wrong. At any religious college or seminary of ours today, you can go out and get yourself a doctorate degree, even become head of the department by doing the very thing that the Bible forbids. You can abandon your classroom, fail to teach the children, and you get yourself a grant and go off to Palestine on some archaeological expedition to uncover what God wanted buried to discover again what God wants to destroy with the sorry situation that you can have experts and authorities in paganism posing as Christian teachers in our school. Enquire not after their God, singing, I wonder how those nations worship their God. You can take it. But don't be too sure you can leave it. Unto the place which the Lord your God hath appointed, the place that he shall choose out among your tribes, there thou shalt come and there thou shalt worship. And there you bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and your heave offerings, 
your vows and your free will offerings, the firstlings of your flocks and herds. The Canaanite nations can worship all over the place, anywhere they please. But you people are going to worship only in the place that I tell you of, or you will not be my people at all. And that place is the place of the sanctuary, that portable tabernacle that they built and brought along from Mount, Sa Mount Sinai. That tabernacle contained their altar, the Ark of the Covenant, the two stone tablets. That was the place where God put his name, the great I Am, the name of the shepherd and the savior of Israel. And in that place, God promised visibly to be present among his people. And to that place and to no other place, they were to come for peace and pardon, for forgiveness and for fellowship for devotion and dedication, in hours of grief and in seasons of joy. And there they were to bring what was required of them and their free will offering. What they owe God as their due and those spontaneous gifts of the heart. Expressions of gratitude for past mercy and pledges for continued blessing in the future. But to that place and to no other they were to come. Moses reminds them of a feature. Don't do the way you've done it here this day. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eye. Now you can get away with that because you have not yet come to your resting place. And the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you. Since the hour that Israel left Egypt, they had no permanent home, no resting place to call their own. The journey that might have taken them six months, they turned into a long and weary 40 years of marching. It was an itinerant lifestyle, pitching their tents, breaking camp, moving on. But that was not going to be typical. Things like that happen in our lives, however. Emergencies do arise. When people and families are wandering and on the move. When our men are called far away to war and battlefront. Then they cannot always worship God in some ideal fashion. Then it's every man for himself, and he's got to do the best that he can see he can do. And God allows for that. But when you are settled down, and when things return to normal in your life, when you go over Jordan and dwell in the land which God giveth you, then there shall be one place that the Lord shall choose. And take heed that you don't bring your offerings to any other place, but only in the place which the Lord your God himself shall choose. Then men, that when their lives returned to normal, and each man had his home and his fig tree in the promised land, that they could worship only at the place God appointed. Now, remember, they were as diverse a people as you and I are here today. They came from as many different callings in life. The farmers from Ephraim, herdsmen from Manasseh, soldiers from Benjamin, politicians from Dan, merchants from Zebulun, Laborers from Issachar. But it made no difference. They will all worship at the place God appoints. But what if a man lived on the distant frontier? 
or what if he lived in the shadow of the sanctuary? Didn't make any difference at all. But what if the Canaanite nations worshipped wherever they pleased? And what if the sacrifices of the Egyptians resembled Israel? That didn't make any difference either. But what if you had a journey a long way to the sanctuary? And what if the priests were phony and the ritual purely mechanical? What if the people as a nation abandoned the house of God in that appointed place? As far as yours concerned, that doesn't make any difference at all. But when the people scattered to their homes, you could argue. Who's to see what they secretly worshipped and practiced in their lives? Who was going to arrest them if they didn't come to the house of the Lord? And if they did come, how did you know that their hearts were in it? Oh, God could. God would. And you could argue that you could worship God in the privacy of your own home. And you could argue that you got more out of it mingling among a group of like-minded people than going over with that crowd of complete strangers at the house of God. You could argue that way. But it still didn't make any difference. You will worship God at the place God wants to be worshipped or you will not worship him at all. You see, it was so terribly important to Israel. For if they disturbed the picture, if they confused the sacrifices, then they would never recognize the Christ, the Son of God, when he came. Then they would lose their identity as the people of God. And believe me, Moses knows what he's talking about. It turned out that way in later history. No sooner were they in the promised land than they abandoned the sanctuary of God at Shiloh. And every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And if that sounds like perfect liberty to you, be sure you read the disgusting record. David later on ushered in the golden age of Israel. And the Jews did as we do. Glamorized David as the golden boy, the military hero. And forget that the larger part of scripture was devoted to his reorganizing the worship of the Lord at the house of God in Jerusalem. When Solomon died, civil war broke out. And the ten larger tribes to the north went downhill and finally disappeared from the pages of history. And why? Because they set their own altars up. They forfeited the right anymore to be called the people of God. And they were gone forever from God's sight. That's what Moses is telling them. Bring whatever you want, but bring it to the place and in the way that God appoints. He mentioned that point repeatedly and woven throughout is this odd thing. Sacrifices only at the house of God. But if you want to kill the animals for food, Slaughter them in your distant rangelands. That's okay too. With one reminder. That you never eat of the blood. But pour it out upon the ground. For the blood is sacred. You're never to become callous to the sanctity of life. In time of war. In time of confusion. You must never forget that the blood is the seed of life, the symbol of life, the reminder of God's gift of life. We New Testament Christians understand that. 
If we throw that teaching away, we lose the value of Christ Jesus' sacrifice. We lose the meaning of what it meant that he was the Lamb of God. The Bible teaches that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. St. Paul said, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. St. John said to the weary and careworn, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Learn that. Keep God in the middle. Keep the house of your God in the center of life. It will anchor you and keep you from drifting and from wandering. When the storms come, as storms do, and the heartache and the disappointment and the daily conflict and monotony and boredom of day-to-day living, Keep the house of God in the center of your life. The overall picture is too much for you. Too large, too immense, too complex for us to comprehend. That's God's business. Ours is to keep the house of God in the center of our lives. Amen.